Hi, everyone, and welcome back to Data Society Speaker Series. Uh, this is our second event of the semester. Uh, today we have with us uh, Michael Phelan, uh, a data science leader at Johnson & Johnson. Um, so I guess to get started, um, Michael, do you want to give us a quick introduction about yourself? Sure. So, hi, folks. My name is Mick Phelan. I'm data science leader in Johnson & Johnson. I've been working and studying in data science before it was called data science, when we used to call it operations research or statistics or whatever. So for the last 20 years, um, I have a master's in management science, now business analytics from the Smurfit School in UCD. And I also have a PhD in evolutionary algorithms from the Smurfit School in UCD. So well acquainted with uh, UCD. Um, I suppose data science is an area I'm incredibly passionate about. Uh, I think we're only really scratching the surface on what we can you know how we can use data science to to uh, derive business value for for companies um and it's an area that i suppose an area i love talking about and um any questions that anyone may have i'd be more than happy to answer thanks uh michael uh i guess a general question to get started would be um how would you distinguish from your vast experience a good data scientist from just an average data scientist? Um, I would say a great, so, so I, I, I actually I lecture in data science at the moment in CIT and last night I was covering one, one of my lectures and I have a slide about data science is, there's an art and a science in data science. So the science is you know, they said, they also said that if you know Michelangelo was alive today, he'd be a data scientist. So the the science part of data science is the stuff you want to learn in college. It's going to your machine learning models, data, JSON, XML, data coming from databases, SQL, NoSQL, machine learning, neural networks, operations research modeling, evolutionary algorithms, all that. So the tools and the techniques. Um, and you know, they're just the entry level. They get you in the door. So any degree that you do is about it, you know, no degree can completely cover the gamut of data science. So what it does is it gives you a high level smattering of tools and theories that you should be able to use going forward. But for me, the real art form is what makes separates out a data scientist from a great data scientist. Somebody that can actually, I don't want to sound like, you know, someone from the matrix or Neo looking through you know, the matrix and seeing ones and zeros. But it's almost looking through the data that you've been given to see the patterns that you could link it to. So to, to see through the data. So I give you an example. Someone can send you an email with a PDF. You don't see an email with a PDF. You see how you can link using natural language processing, using AI to strip down that PDF into text, and then using NLP to clean the text, and then using maybe TFIDF or vectorization or whatever to elicit you know, meaningful patterns within that text to other PDFs or other data sources. So as a, as a data scientist, you're always trying to, you know, think beyond what you've been given and see, you know, how can I bring in information from other sources? And, and the one thing that I, I would say, particularly to, to, you know, junior data scientists, people coming out of college, you can, you can never know, you know, you never know enough. The more educated you become, the more you realize how much you don't know. Uh, I remember my my supervisor, uh, Sean McGarry from UCD, as he said to me, are you prepared to more or less, and you know, Sean would never say it like this, but to paraphrase him, he would say, you know, are you prepared to really find out how dumb you are? Because, you know, as you learn more, you realize there's so much more to learn and you don't, you, you, there's only so much you can cover. So I would always say, particularly to, you know, new data scientists, the acquisition of knowledge is a key skill that only you can master as you understand the skills and the tools, but as you move into the art form of data science and how to create a good data model and what features fit well in a machine learning model and what features don't fit well. And you know, in a BI model, I call them attributes in a machine learning model, I call them features. They're the same thing. So, you know, it's about really exploring the landscape of data and models and thinking beyond the box and being able to acquire and being inquisitive you know, the real great data scientists are incredibly inquisitive. You know, they love solving problems. And it's only you get this hit of adrenaline when you solve the problem. 
Now, you do probably sometimes have to go and actually do a bit more and just solve the problem. You have to make a solution because otherwise it's just going to sit in the shelf. But you get that real kick of adrenaline when you've overcome a problem. And I think that's, for me, that's the mark of, you know, I think the analogy I used in my class yesterday was if you take a, you know, a, a Division Four soccer player, they know all the skills, but they just, you know, they're no David Beckham or they don't, they're, they're not, you know, a Mo Salah and whatever it is about these people, they can see that they can, they know where the ball is going before it's been passed. They know where the players are on the pitch without having to look. So they have this, you know, innate intuition to, to make them the best in the world at what they do. Now, I'm not saying, you know, a great data scientist is, you know, Mo Salah or anything like that, but in every domain, you have, you know, the marquee players that you hear about. So in data science, you'd hear about the light, you know, in, in Ireland, we've got some, in UCD, you've got some phenomenal data scientists. In in, in Ireland, we have, you know, a phenomenal breadth of data scientists. Um, but that would, that would be some of my thoughts on what makes a, a great data scientist. Thanks, Mick. So you touched on it briefly when you said you st first started doing data science, you didn't necessarily call it that. Um, so how, how did you move into data science and your academics? Is that something, um, your academic background in data science, is that something that followed your uh, your professional experience or was it the other way around? It's the other way around. Um, actually, my, when I did my leaving cert, my first choice was art in UCD. I wanted to do maths and history and political science. But my father pointed out to me at the time, he goes, you know, you're not really a big fan of reading. Maybe you should do something like maths, you know. So I went and did a maths degree in UL. Um, and from there, then I did the master's in business analytics. So the reason it wasn't, data science is only a new term. It's only been around the last five, 10 years. So data science is kind of a, the all encapsulating terminology for stuff that's been around for 100 years. Statistics is pretty old. Operations research has been around since World War II. Um, a lot of the algorithms we use today have been around since the 1960s and 70s. Neural networks have been around for a long time. But what, what we have today is the confluence of massive amounts of data, cheap computing power, and these, uh, these old algorithms that were originally designed on pen and paper. But what those algorithms needed to be successful was lots of data and lots of computing power. So if you take, you know, why do why are um, why are neural networks using GPUs and why is the Nvidia stock price shot through the roof? It wasn't because of games. I'm sure games gave the Nvidia stock price a good kick, all right. But if you look at, you know, things like neural networks, they do trivial calculations, but they have to do billions and billions of trivial calculations. Same with computer graphics. Deciding what color a pixel should be in a screen. It's a trivial calculation, but they have to do billions of them to get how you know to get really, really high-end graphics on a, on, a, on a game. So the GPUs lend themselves very well. So I suppose when I was in college, it wasn't called data science because the term hadn't been coined yet. I think Tom Davenport or one of those was the first to, to, to coin the term in the last kind of 10 years. Before that, it was, you know, you kind of had this intersection of disciplines. You were a software engineer, you, you knew about databases, you were good at statistics, you knew operations research, you had a bit of this and a bit of that. Whereas now it's like data science. But what I've seen as well in the last five years is you've, you've even seen data science now being broken down into data engineering or machine learning engineering or neural network engineering or reinforcement learning engineering. So you're actually seeing those specialisms, you know, because data science is now kind of a, a kind of a catch all term nearly. Um, so you're seeing a lot more even people saying, I want a data engineer or I want a machine learning engineer or I want someone specifically to work on natural language processing or I want an operations research person. So again, you're seeing that um, those distinctions being drawn to try and, you know, I suppose, look for specific uh, skill sets coming out of the marketplace. And um, a, a lot of people might say that getting into data science as an industry, uh, the academic barrier can be quite high sometimes, that a lot of positions require graduate degrees as a minimum. Uh, what would your position be on that? And how do you, when do you feel is the right time to, to go for an advanced degree? Um, I, I'll give you two answers to when the right time to go to an advanced degree. Um, so first of all, I would say, you know, I wouldn't look a lot of organizations, particularly the multinationals, won't look at you unless you've got a minimum of a bachelor's degree, one, one, two, one, um, but preferably, 
particularly in data science, because remember, data science is a new term, but the, f the field of study is old. Maths is an old discipline. It's not like a new discipline that you don't see too many people out there with masters. So having a master's or a PhD in computer science or maths or statistics, you know, isn't that far-fetched because there's plenty of people out there with it. Um, so I think particularly in the large multinationals, what you're looking at is they get so many people applying for jobs. They just, you know, the first thing you got to do is you got to say, right, you got to have minimum a degree. And then, you know, what level of degree do you have? And then have you got, you know, postgraduate qualification? Because think of what a degree is as well. If, if you come in to me and you're saying you want to be a data scientist and you've got no background whatsoever, you've no degree, at least in a degree, you know, at least in the degree you've, you know, looked at the tools and techniques. So you've, you've studied your trade. It's like a plumber. You know, a person doesn't rock up to your house and say, I want to be a plumber. Will you let me at your sink? Thinking, no, nah, we won't. We'll, how about we ring a plumber instead? So, you know, a plumber goes and learns their trade and they have to be qualified as well. They have to do exams and, you know, it's, it's about saying, are you competent in your discipline? So a degree is only entry level. You know, a degree is only the very start of your journey. Um, in terms of doing an advanced degree, I would recommend just whether it's right or wrong, the world has gone that way, that you're probably going to have to do an advanced degree. You know, but I would say for most people, masters, taught masters is probably enough. Maybe research masters if you've got a specific project in mind. Um, and if you're really into it, then do a PhD. But um, I wouldn't do what I did where I dragged it out way too long. And, you know, if you're going to do a PhD, uh, you, you, there's two schools of thought. One, you wait till you got a bit of experience and you find a topic that you really love and then, you know, you, you, you research it. Or two, you just get in and out of college as quick as you can. So you do your degree, you do your PhD. So maybe you do your degree, you do a research master's, you convert your research master's into a research PhD and you get your PhD, get in and out. Bing bang bosh, seven years out the door, um, and then you start your, you know, your your working career, or maybe you want to stay in academia. So um, it depends. There's no right or wrong answer. It depends on, you know, definitely get your degree. Probably look at an advanced degree soon enough. You know, don't let it go too long because it does get harder. Like remember, the one thing that you have on your side, particularly if you're, you know, you're not going back as a mature student. You have youth on your side. You you don't have a lot of um you don't have a lot of you know commitments maybe uh, you don't have you know kids and stuff like that it's tough going doing you know an advanced degree at night time after a day's work with kids you know it's not pleasant uh, so you know if you're going to do that kind of stuff just get it out of the way early and you know enjoy your life and live your life um that would be <laughs> that would be someone who's maybe been burnt a bit but anyway thanks michael um I guess uh, just for a reminder for everyone watching that you can ask questions uh, in the chat, in the comments there. And um, so I guess going more into what you currently do in your career and uh, J&J, &J, so would you mind just telling us what you do at Johnson & Johnson? Sure. So I currently am a data science specialist in a, an R&D group, which is part of our supply chain organization. Um, so we have... We've, we're a small enough team, but there's only about kind of 30 people in our team. And I would be the, the specialist data science person there. But, but I suppose what I've done is that over the years, I've kind of built out a pretty broad skill set. So, you know, I'm a software engineer and, you know, I can design and develop databases. I can design web-based front ends. Um, I'm pretty au fait with cloud technologies. I'm a data scientist. Uh, I can develop modeling, um, you know, so... I'm, I'm kind of like a jack of all trades at this stage, but obviously I've learned different parts as, as I've gone along. So I kind of bring that smorgasbord of, of skills. Um, most of my work today is probably done in, in Python, but you know, I've, I've spent a lot of time in Java and C Sharp as well. And I think at one stage, even COBOL and Delphi, which is object oriented Pascal, but um, you can talk to Patrick Keenan and UCD about that for more. Uh, so it's, it's really, my, my big thing at the moment is, you know, working with business partners to identify, you know, decision-supported solutions, data-driven decision-supported solutions. 
So, you know, there's a, there's a guy on the, the, that does be on the data science circuit called Bill Schmarzo. He's the CTO of Hitachi Ventara. And he's great. He's probably the two best speakers on the analytics circuit that I've seen now. I haven't seen everybody, but two of the best speakers that I've seen would be Mark Gallagher, who's um, from Formula One. He's, he's, he's given talks at the Analytics Institute of Ireland. He's brilliant. If you ever get the chance, watch his podcast. He's, he's phenomenal. He's got great stories about Formula One. Uh, and how you know advanced analytics was driving Formula One before it was driving anything else, um, and and but Bill Schmarzo, he talks about uh, very much engaging with your business customer to clearly articulate what is the question that you're trying to answer. So for me, that's a huge part because you know if you look at traditionally in software engineering, again a lot of pitfalls. You were going building software that answered a question that nobody was asking. Because you didn't take the time to clearly understand what is it, what is the question. Um, so data science is even more complex because there's more moving parts because you have to collect more data and you have to generate models and you have to test the efficacy of the models and whatnot. So it's really working with business partners to clearly articulate what is the question that you want to answer. So for me, I like to think about it like apps. So if you think an app on your phone, you have a calendar app or you have a phone app or, or whatever. So the calendar app is a, it's a calendar doesn't uh, take phone calls and take pictures, you know, it doesn't take selfies of you and the dog. It's just a calendar and it's very good and it doesn't need an instruction booklet. Now, you guys are young enough to, to kind of not remember what it was like to have a calculator for leaving cert and a bloody instruction booklet for the calculator was bigger than the calculator itself. So nowadays with app-based approaches, these apps are excellent at doing one or two things very well. So if you think about answering a question for a business partner and you want to develop an app-based approach to your data science, you may have several apps answering several questions. Um, and then, you know, not everything that you do is going to get out, out of the table. So what we would see a lot of the time is an awful lot of kind of university style hacking. Um, and the answer might live in an Excel file or might live in a Python file or whatever, or a Jupyter notebook or whatever you want to use. But if it's not consumable, how does somebody use that? How does that actually make a difference? And is it just an academic exercise? So clearly articulate what the question is, then see, can you answer the question? And then if you can answer the question, go back to the business partner and say to them, right, there's the question. We've answered the question. Were you asking the right question? And if the answer to all of those is yes, then maybe look at, at productionization. But a lot of stuff you would see, you could probably pray it out and say 80, 20, 20% 20 of the stuff that gets developed doesn't go into production. So you, you have a lot of proof of concepts, but they bring value too, as long as you don't let the proof of concept drag on forever. So time box it, maybe take an agile approach to it and say, look, we're going to do three sprints on this, but we're going to spend the first sprint clearly articulating what it is you actually need as opposed to what you want. Because remember what the customer needs and what the customer wants can be quite different. That's a great answer, Mick. Thank you. So we have a question here from Finton. Uh, he asks, what do you think of online data science courses like Le Wagon? If you're familiar with it, it's like an online boot camp uh, for so, learning data science as opposed to an expensive master's degree. So um, I'm not familiar with Le Wagon. I am familiar with Udacity and Udemy and Coursera and similar online tools. So I suppose what I look for is I would look for, you know, Potentially, I would look for the master's degree, but then I would look for what online materials have been done as well. Because remember, traditional education moves a lot slower because, you know, you know, if you've ever been involved in actually delivering a university course, there's a lot of work goes into creating that module and getting that module, you know, approved within the university structures. And then, you know, sometimes these things can take a year or two to, to even make available. So universities, by their nature, will move at a slower pace to the advances in AI. AI is advancing a lot quicker than, you know, traditional university courses. So what I would say to people is, you know, get your, get your degree. Um, if you're interested in doing a master's, it won't do you any harm, but you don't need to do that straight away. But what I would say is, yes, do online courses. So if you've identified a gap, so you've, you have you don't know enough about natural language processing, but you're interested in the job in natural language processing, do recognize courses. So a lot of these courses even link into your LinkedIn profile now. So if I do a course, I did some of the Coursera courses a couple of years ago, and I found them really good. It actually really helped me to learn. 
but pick a course that actually has exams in it because I don't know what it's like for you guys, but you know, I don't learn anything. You, you go through something and it's like, oh yeah, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And then do you ever, you, you're studying in college and you're in the class and yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And then you go back in week 13 to over your notes and you're thinking, geez, I have no idea what happened there. Um, and then you go into an exam. But the, so the exam focuses your mind to remember stuff longer term. So I would say, you know, don't do the ones that don't have exams and stuff like that because they're not as good. They're not as good from a learning perspective. But definitely, you know, always be learning and, and to build up your profile because it is a, a difficult marketplace out there. Build up your profile with online courses. Pick good ones. Pick ones. Don't just pick any old one at all. Pick, you know, identify what your gaps are, the areas you're interested in, and pick the best courses to go after. So you'll see lots of reviews there on if I wanted to do an, a natural language processing course, where would the best place to do that? You know, obviously price could be a factor as well. Some of them are more expensive than others, so you've got to work that out for yourself. Um, and then they go onto your LinkedIn profile and you put them onto your CV. So yes, do those as well. Um, but sometimes, you know, you may need to supplement with a master's degree as well depending on um, whether you find there's a gap in your CV or not. And, and only you know the answer to that. Brilliant. So our next question is, um, so in, uh, in big corporations like Johnson & Johnson, obviously top level management are very rely reliant on data and reports in, in big decision making. How involved are data science departments at big corporations in uh, big management decisions? So I would, say, I would say there's been a massive shift. Um, I can speak for Johnson & Johnson. There has been a massive shift, um, in the la particularly in the last five years. So we now have two chief data science officers based out of the US, uh, one for Janssen R&D, which is our pharmaceutical wing. Uh, so Nijad Khan, she's our chief data science officer in pharmaceutical R&D. Palo Sharma is our chief data science officer in supply chain, enterprise supply chain, so across all supply chain functions in J&J. &J. And then we have Jim Swanson, who is our, well, he's, he's there a year now, but he relatively new CIO for all of J&J. &J. And Jim Swanson is a massive proponent of data science. So millions of dollars are being spent by large corporations on data science. They recognize so I give, give you the statistic that they would say that 90% of the world's data will be generated in the next two years. So data is rising at an absolutely exponential rate and it's coming in from largely unstructured sources. So it takes a lot more work to actually generate structure out of that. Most organizations are swimming in data, drowning in data. So they recognize that, you know, understanding their data is not just the purview of data scientists. It's the purview of everybody in the organization. Everybody up needs to upskill and become data literate. But you do need then your data scientists that can really, you know, go after the big problems, the, you know, the problems that have the biggest return on investment. So I would say, you know, we, um, our data science, our supply chain data science group last week brought out a business um, impact re report. And, and you're talking potential billions of dollars of impact here, you know, across large enterprise problems. So it's, you know, you're, you're talking big money. Um, so you're investing heavily in your data, you're investing in your technology stacks, but the biggest investment has to be in your people because, you know, there's, there's two reports there, one from Gartner and one from the Harvard Business Review that would show that even though there's up to an 85% failure rate in AI projects in industry, most companies are investing heavily in AI because they see it as a key enabler going forward. But the biggest areas, the biggest gaps are in people and process, not in technology. So if people say technology is, is, is the problem, the, these reports would show, and this is what I would see this all the time, technology is generally not the problem. We've never had cheaper computing power, AWS, Google, Microsoft, IBM. We've never had cheap, cheap cheaper data storage. Hang on a, sorry, hang on a sec. We've never had cheaper data storage. You know, um, it's absolutely phenomenal what you can do for relatively little money. So organizations are spending heavily, uh, but I think the biggest gap um, is people and process. So, you know, having the right people, everybody to be data literate, um, but then having the, you know, your data scientists that can do more with data than your average Joe. So, yeah, 
you're seeing it the whole time. You know, I think there was a report came out a couple of years ago. Tom Davenport talks about like data scientists being the unicorns of the 21st century because to get an excellent data scientist, it's like finding a unicorn in the forest. There just ain't too many of them out there. So companies are looking for it, and companies still don't even understand. You know, some companies still haven't even gotten to grasp with what do they need to to turn their data into actionable insight. So. You know, it's it's like this big wall that they're looking up, and the wall is getting higher and higher because there's more and more data being generated. So, yeah, there's a lot of money being spent in data science, AI, and data engineering, and all that kind of stuff. Thanks, uh, Michael. Uh, we have another question from the chat from Eva Green. Uh, what industry industries slash sectors in Ireland and abroad do you think will be most impacted by increases in effective data science implementation? But I think, you know, Ireland is, if you look at the sectors in Ireland, that Ireland is renowned for, you know, you've got a big tech sector here. So you've got, you know, Google, Facebook, you've got all your tech companies, you've the Dells, the Apples, you know, most of the large tech companies, whether it's, you know, social media or, or whatever, have a very strong base, if not their European headquarters in Ireland. So all those sectors, they're what we would call digitally born companies. They're analytics competitors. So there's an article there, Tom Davenport has the, you know, on competing on analytics, I would recommend you have a quick read of that. So he talks about analytic competitors and companies that want to be analytic competitors, they use data and analytics to compete against other companies. So look at the likes of Facebook and Google. They compete against each other to, to sell you stuff. Uh, and Amazon, they're all competing against each other to sell you products and to have people, you know, do ad clicks with them. So do I want to put an ad click on, on the Google platform, on the Facebook platform, or on an Amazon platform? Where am I going to get the best bang for my buck? So that's one sector that obviously data science and AI is, is huge. Um, we also have a massive healthcare sector in Ireland. We're, you know, we've some of the top uh, medical device and pharmaceutical companies based here. Um, we have a very, very strong manufacturing industry particularly in the medical device and pharmaceuticals. And you can see now IoT and AI enabled solutions is becoming more and more prevalent in these spaces as well. So that's another sector that we we, we are probably world leaders in really. Um, I think someone showed a graph about, you know, the, the top pharmaceutical manufacturers in Ireland, you know, all multinational companies. You know, we have Janssen, we have um, Biomarin, we have Pfizer, we have Novartis. We have the biggest ones in the world, and they're all within a two-hour drive nearly of each other. So they're all competing for the, the same talent pool in Ireland. Uh, what other sectors have you got? They're kind of the two that jump out on me, consumer electronics. Um, you know, you've got your Dells and your Apples as well, that, that, that type of work. Uh, oh, yeah, finance. Finance is obviously a huge one as well. Some large finance companies have relocated their European operations to Ireland because of Brexit. And, and obviously fintech is, is a huge one. So AI and fintech is, is an absolutely massive growth area as well. So we're well tended in Ireland uh, in terms of, we have the industries that require AI. So I don't think we have, uh, I don't think we have too much to worry about there in the, in the short term anyway. Thanks, Michael. Um, uh, something that I find very interesting is you were involved with the JNJ Data Science Hackathon in 2020 and you won it. So I don't know if you can run us through that experience. How was it? What projects were you working on? Sure. So actually last year, as I mentioned, you know, the, the there's been a massive push. Last year I saw three or four large scale hackathons in JNJ and data science. The previous year I don't think there was any. So you know, the, the three players that I've mentioned to you, you know, data science has become huge in J&J. Um, so there was one called the Open Science Hackathon, which had eight categories. And what they had done was they had gone out to business leaders and said, you know, give us your problems and we'll see, can we work it into a hackathon subject? Um, so they did that and they provided the data and they provided the SME knowledge. And then they actually used the data science. The big thing about that hackathon was what they wanted to do is they wanted to blend people from the business and diff so you know people from the business and people from technology and people from data science they didn't want to have teams of data scientists so they actually used an ai algorithm themselves to create the team so we're saying on my team i was the only data scientist on the team we had some um so i was working for 
the bio research um, quality team and what they wanted to they wanted to you know grammarly use Grammarly in college and it tells you, you know, don't use that word or that's profanity or that's PII or whatever Grammarly. What they wanted to do was they wanted to see if they could get someone to hack a solution. So you would type in your quality report. And as you can imagine in a validated healthcare industry like uh, pharmaceuticals or medical device, um, these reports matter because an auditor could look at that report and you know if the report isn't of good quality you could get into trouble for it and you don't want that so and remember as if you're writing reports you could be at the start of your career so you mightn't be the best at writing reports or you may be very you know advanced in your career and you're very good at writing reports so they were looking for an ai enabled solution to um they'd identified 16 areas that you know reports can suffer um and could the ai you know find could they score up a report based on each one of the 16 areas and offer recommendations in each one of the 16 areas as well so we we created a web-based tool we heavily leveraged cloud-based technologies for language transcription and language uh, analytics um, and then we developed some natural language processing models looking at you know syntax chunking and things like that so we were able to but we were able to package it all up in a nice web-based tool that made it very intuitive for the end user and um, so actually more time actually went into the user interface of it than the AI part of it, which is, you know, probably not uncommon. Um, and, you know, we were very successful and we were lucky to, to win our category, which was the augmented writing category. So there's a next question we have here is about the, uh, the data scientist of the year award you were given in 2018. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. So, um, for the last, there wasn't one this year, but for the last four or five years, there's been the DATSI Awards, and the DATSI is now a European award, or has been for the last two or three years. And um, at the time, the DATSI, you know, when when I first heard of the DATSI Award, it was the, um, the so the DATSI Award is the brainchild of uh, Linda Next Generation Recruitment, um, or formerly Next Generation. I think she's still involved in Next Generation Recruitment. But Linda Davis in, in Dublin, and it was her idea was, you know, she's not a data scientist. Um, but what Linda wanted to do was she wanted to bring together um, the best minds in data science initially in Ireland to compete in a, a selection of competitions. And now you've got the AI awards and you've got the analytics industry or the analytics Institute of Ireland. So you've got several uh, awards now in Ireland. But at, at, at that time, that was the only one. And the first year we actually entered it, um, I was leading a data science team at Cork at the time, we actually entered in the large company category for a project that we'd worked on using um, uh, genetic algorithms and simulation. Um, and unfortunately, we didn't win that year. We uh, we were pipped by Microsoft, but you know, it's okay to be beaten by Microsoft when it comes to AI because, well, let's face it, they are one of the better ones. Um, so, but it was great to be finalists in, in that competition. And then the following year then obviously entered again in the data scientist of the year category and um, so it was about looking at you know the the projects the execution of projects the the development of teams you know working internally within companies to upskill people mentor people internally mentor people externally as well and the community engagement so you know talking at events like this and I, I do a 10 week Lego robotics course for 10 year olds in my local primary school. So to show them the intersection of engineering, which is building Lego and um, computer science, which is the programming of the mod, the, the Lego robot uh, and mathematics, which is, you know, the instructions that you're programming into the Lego robot. So all of these things, you know, I was, I was fortunate enough to, um, to be shortlisted with some excellent candidates and, um, you know, obviously very fortunate to, to have come out on the right side of it that year. Uh, so since then, I've actually been involved as a judge in the, the DATSI Awards. Um, and I would highly recommend uh, when all these awards come back around again, particularly face-to-face, uh, -face, it's great for peer networking. And it's a great day out to actually go and celebrate with your peers in an area. Yes, we're all geeks, but let's own it. And, you know, I go into a room and, you know, great surroundings like we we go to the we go to the Crow Park Conference Center every year and uh, you geek out and, you know, you get some great speakers and you just get to kind of, I suppose, you know, enjoy the company of like minded individuals um, and 
there's often free gin as well. So it's, um, what's not to like? Brilliant. Uh, so this is kind of a follow-on question from something we talked about earlier. Um, you know, it's 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 easy to say that data science is, is important for the large companies and probably every large corporation needs some form of a data science team. Do you think we'll see more and more uh, smaller companies, maybe SMEs, trying to incorporate aspects of data science? Do you think we'll see more kind of off-the-shelf off solutions for, for smaller companies? Yeah, I think, look, there's a plethora of solutions out there, and that's the problem, really. There's so many solutions that smaller companies don't know what solution to go for. So, you know, as a rule of thumb, you can always look at the Gartner Magic Quadrant for, you know, business intelligence tools, for AI tools, for, you know, AI consultancy. So that's usually a good kind of a starting point. Go to and look at the Magic Quadrant and see who's in the kind of each one of the, quadr the quadrants there. Um, Absolutely. Companies that don't invest in, in AI and data science won't be around in 10 years' time. But smaller companies don't have the luxury of having a natural language processing engineer. So smaller companies need people like myself who have got a software engineering background, can develop front ends, can develop back ends, can develop AI models. And so more of a kind of a, a an all-rounder in data science, uh, incorporating data science, because they don't really care what title you have. They don't have the luxury or the budget for titles. They just want somebody to implement a solution. And if there's AI involved in that, then well and good. But, you know, you make you need to support it as well. So there's many ways of doing it. As I said, every company, it's, I believe it's the, you know, the ownership is on every company to upskill their workforce to be data literate because, you know, the workforce is the ones generating the data in companies and the stuff coming in externally as well. But if you're just generating data for data's sake, you're just going to drown in it. So you have to be more data uh, data literate, uh, be more kind of data lean as well. Don't be generating data just because you can, because you know it's not going to be used. And then have people within teams that have that broader skill set because you can't afford just to have specific data scientists. And I've been to several conferences over the years where even people from large companies would say to you, because if you think large companies most of the time are actually very siloed departments that might know what another department is working on. So you might be in a large company of 130,000 people, but that could be made up of thousands of departments not knowing what the other thousand departments are working on. So it's almost like these smaller little companies in the bigger company um, and so they don't have a need for a specialist NLP person. Either. They still want somebody that can do the end-to-end -end solution design and development and, you know, rolling it out. So I think um, it's it's only some of the really high-end providers that are looking for very specific skill sets. So I, I think there's room for everybody, and it really comes down to what you want to do. Do you want to be a specialist, an SME in one area, uh, working in a specific domain. So do you want to go for the likes of the Googles or the Amazons or whatever? Or do you want to be more of a generalist and, and work in smaller companies that allows you much a much wider breadth of experience? You might have to do the videos and the marketing and you have to sell what you're doing and then develop what you're doing as well. So I think there's lots of opportunities out there for to, to cater for every flavor. Thanks, Michael, for that answer. Um, a question that uh, I'm particularly interested in is uh, I've seen that you've worked in Ireland, you've worked in Australia, and I think for a little bit in India as well, if I'm not mistaken. Um, I know that they're all in different, during different times, but um, how does working in, in other countries uh, grow your skills? And maybe a follow-up question would be, how does Ireland compare to the rest of the world in terms of adapting to the data-driven era? So, you know, if you get the opportunity to work in another country, um, I would take it. Um, I suppose if you look at the, the, you know, the biggest, the biggest culturally different country I worked in was India. Uh, so I worked for Tata Consulting in India for a short time. Um, and it wasn't kind of what I learned working, you know, in software engineering. It was what I learned about the culture and the people. Um, and such a different culture to the Irish culture. Uh, but it's fascinating. It's a fascinating country. And it's just so widely different from, from, from Ireland because we're a very homogenous little society. Like, you know, 20 years ago, you know, it was largely, you know, single skin color, very, you know what I mean? We're, we're not, in the last 20 years, we've seen more, more of an explosion because of people emigrating, you know, 
inward um, emigration into the country as opposed to net emigration out of the country. I might have those terms incorrect. But we've a lot more diversity of culture now than we had 20 years ago. And that's a good thing because the world is so global now. And we're seeing that with a pandemic. A pandemic that starts in one part of the world, three months later shuts down the world because we are a global society. So if you get the opportunity to work in another country, you should take it. I think it's, it's really good. Like I worked in Australia and New Zealand and you would think, you know, working in Australia and New Zealand, should, you know, they're more or less the same. They're not culturally, they're very different. The, the Kiwis are quite different to the Aussies culturally. Um, and, you know, they're all quite, you know, different culturally to the Irish as the English are different culturally. But we share a lot of common culture, but we are quite different at the same time. Um, so... Well, you know, I was talking to one of our CIOs in, in Asia Pac recently in Malaysia, and what they need is data scientists that understand the culture of the geography and where you're based. So while they may have a hub and spoke model with their core data science team based out of Malaysia, they need people to understand the, geograph the, the geographies and where they're operating. So the cultural differences of India versus China versus Malaysia versus Australia versus New Zealand versus Japan, you know, much more diverse culturally in Asia Pac. Uh, EMEA then is more diverse culturally probably than the US is. You've got more kind of homogeneity in the US, in North America, anyway, between US and Canada. But again, still cultural differences there as well. So, you know, culture is a big thing. Because remember, if, if, you do, if you have data science, you have to be able to sell it. You have to be able to market your data science. And you may have the best data science model in the world, but if you can't sell it, and that could largely come down to you not being understanding the culture and the region that you're trying to sell it into. No one's going to buy it. So to make it, it doesn't make a difference how good you are at the maths. You have to appreciate, you know, who your audience is and, and how you sell into that audience. So culture is, is huge. Culture of an organization is also important. Organizations that talk about wanting to embrace data science because they went to some Gartner conference and they came back and went, oh, we need AI. Uh, I remember talking to... Um, one of the one of the senior uh, people in Deloitte uh, at the Datsies two years ago, and um, he said, you know, the amount of clients he had coming into him at the time saying, we need blockchain. And he said, to him, what do you need blockchain for? We need blockchain to do X. And he goes, no, you just need a relational database to do X. You know, they just heard they need a blockchain or they needed AI because, you know, it's the latest and greatest thing and we need it. So, you know, the culture of an organization has to be right as well to embrace change because, you know, in bringing AI and data science into an organization does require cultural change. It's that people and process piece that tends to fall over, not the technology piece. So cultural, geographical culture and culture within an organization are huge and they're not to be underestimated because they will generally be the things that AI will fail on, cultural as opposed to technological. Um, what was the other part of that? I'm after losing my train of thought there. Um, it was it was about like how does Ireland compare to the other countries in terms of adapting to that cultural change that you're talking about? So I I know I'm completely biased because you know I chose to come back from Australia to work in Ireland um, and I like working here and I think it's you know I think it's a great country. We have our flaws like any other country. The one thing the Irish do great, particularly when it comes to multinationals is we will, we, so you have a multinational here. What we do is we, we are better than our brother and sister multinational uh, plants in the US because we have to be, because they're US, most of them are US companies. So for them to invest in Ireland, you know, they may come here for one reason, but you know, there's a lot of talk about, you know, they come to Ireland for 10 years for tax incentives and then they leave. Apple didn't leave. They've been here since the 80s. Dell haven't left. They've been here since the 90s. And Dell have now got two massive sites. They've got the Cherrywood site in Dublin. They've got the Limerick site, um, which was the original EMF uh, 1 and 3, which were the largest manufacturing sites for personal computers when they were made. But now they've completely evolved what they do in Limerick. And you've got this massive you know, financial services area for Dell in, 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 in Dublin as well. What we do is... We can be better. So take take um, manufacturing. We'll be better at lean than anyone else. We'll be Shingo Award winners. Shingo is, is the top prize you can get for lean manufacturing because we have to be. 
it's like when the Irish, you know, traditionally they would say, you know, when the Irish went to work abroad, they, you know, they got good jobs. Now that's a, that's a broad generalization. There was plenty of lazy feckers went abroad too, but you know, generally when we're here, we're motivated to be the best because we realize that a multinational company could just pick up and leave. You know, there has to be more than tax to keep them here because while the tax is good and the corporation rate is good here, the effective corporation rate in other European countries, when you layer in their different tax regimes, is by and large the same as our tax regime here. And we have a higher tax economy for, you know, we've almost a 50 plus percent tax economy for, for workers. So, you know, to keep people here, you have to be good because we're not cheap. So you have to be giving a good return on investment. So I would say we punch above our weight because we have to. And we've been doing it for 30 years. And it's almost like that's what we do. That's how we do it. So I think, you know, we, we've excelled, particularly in the area of manufacturing. And now you're seeing we're excelling in digital technologies and areas like that. Plus, we, you know, we're fortunate we can play time zone hockey. We're, you know, we can come online with Asia Pack and we can go offline with the US. So, you know, we have a lot going for us here as well in terms of, you know, being able to fly to, to different places. And, you know, you can fly from Dublin to Heathrow and you can go anywhere in the world from Dublin or Heathrow. So we have a lot going for us geographically. And the other thing as well that, you know, we use this as a sales pitch. When we're trying to get additional work into, you know, within j and in Ireland. Now, if you think we have j and in Vision Care in, in Limerick, is the single, I think it's the single largest manufacturing plant of corrective lenses in the world. And that's in Limerick. And that's grown every year. And we have one of the biggest pharmaceutical plants in Cork, Janssen. Um, we have two Janssen sites in Cork and we have two Depucintes sites. And we have some site, we have um, some commercial operations in, in Dublin as well. So we can say to a company like j, &J that no other country in the world can say this, that within two and a half hours, you can go from any one of your largest sites and you have access to in excess of 10 to 12 universities because now with the technological universities coming on stream so you've got the dublin technological university and the monster technological university and i think there's some more to come on so you can now offer data science and ai practitioners from 10 to 12 you know high-end universities within two and a half hour drive of any of your sites that will work longer and be more motivated to be better because they know they have to be because they need to give you a reason to want to stay here other than tax. So I think, you know, we, we do punch above our weight and may we continue to do so for a long time to come. Thank you, Michael. And uh, so we have one last question from the chat here just to round off the interview. So um, Emma is asking, if you've one piece of advice you would give you your younger self, maybe something differently, what would it be? I would have done engineering. <laughs> my first, I remember, <laughs> my first day, it was um, maths analysis one with Dr. John Kinsley at the University of Limerick. And um, I was within the first week or two and he started, this was before, you know, we had whiteboard, you know, he, he'd do it all on these um, acetates and he'd roll the acetates and you, you had to write like mad because he was phenomenal the amount of notes he would give you, but you had to take it all down. And I remember he was giving us a proof or something on why one wasn't equal to zero because, we, you know, we were doing the maths degree in UL, so you had to do the theory of maths, uh, which sounded good on paper, but it wasn't so much fun sometimes. And I remember about two pages in, losing the will to live and him, him saying, and it's at this point the engineers would stop and all I want to say was, I want to be an engineer. I'm good with it. I, I don't need any more of this. So I might have done actually engineering because I'm, I'm you know, I, I like Lego and making things as well. But um, <clears throat> no, I love data science. I love data science. What would I have done differently? If I could give myself one piece of advice <clears throat> would be finished the PhD in half the time that it took me to do it because I just arsed around for forever on it and uh, do that quickly and just get it done uh, or don't do it at all. But whatever you do, don't spend as long messing around with it as I did. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Michael, for uh, for coming on this evening. No problem. My, my pleasure. Great. Ahmed, do you have anything to uh, wrap up? Um, not really, no. I think, I think that's all. Do we have any events coming up, Sam, next week? 
that with the left people over. Um, yeah, I think yeah. we've got a woman in tech next week. Um, I think we have a consulting goal. I'm not sure. We'll keep up on the social media anyway. Yeah, we'll have the details out with the next few events on Monday anyway. So thank you again, Michael, for coming on. Really, really great talk. Thanks so much. No Thanks, problem. Michael. Best of luck. Thanks. Thank you.